Hello, good morning. Good morning. It's on? All right, thanks, great. Hi, uh, welcome to the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, the Great Lakes Analytics and Sports Conference. Uh, in case I haven't met you yet, I'm Scott Tappa, the director of the conference, and uh, we're really happy to have you here for the day you came to, to Central Wisconsin on this June day. Uh, when we first conceived of this conference uh, two or three years ago, our intention was to, to deliver an affordable sports analytics conference to the Midwest. The big question was, would anybody come to Stevens Point uh, in the middle of summer? And uh, just seeing all your faces here today, the answer is yes, and we're really happy about that. Um, we've got a jam-packed day, so I'm going to try to keep this short and get to our presentations, but I wanted to do a few housekeeping notes first. Um, if you've got any uncertainty that your parking is taken care of, uh, please talk to Jennifer and Mary Jo outside, we'll get you all squared away. Um, we will be using four rooms today. This is the alumni room. Uh, we'll be back here for the closing keynote and for about 15 minutes before lunch. We'll also be using the legacy room down the hall for lunch and rooms 374 and 378 for individual breakout sessions. Um, there's signage everywhere. There's a map in your program. Uh, just uh, refer to that or ask. Um, one morning, I just realized that the clock in room 374 is broken, not working, so don't rely on the clock in 374. Uh, use your phone, okay, or your watch. Uh, restrooms uh, are down the hall and to the left and the right. Uh, women's on the left, men's on the right. There's signage for that. Um, we will have a few breaks here. We'll have a five minute break here after John's talk at 9.05, uh, at 10.40, and at 2.30, and that's in addition to the lunch break, okay? Uh, after the 11.15 to 11.45 session, we ask that you return here to this room uh, so that our poster presenters and a couple of the authors we have here in attendance can uh, give you a, a, a little description of what they're going to be presenting over the lunch break, okay? Um, there's directions on accessing the wireless network on the inside front cover of your program. Uh, so let, uh, let us know if you're having any problems with that, but it should be fine. Uh, a big thank you to our continuing education staff, uh, Jennifer Hess especially out at the, uh, at the registration desk. And a big thank you to Marsha Lee, our catering manager, who uh, prepared all the food that we've got coming today. And uh, I'm a big Twitter guy. Uh, I see a couple of you have already been on Twitter already. Uh, See, some of you are bragging about your first time in Wisconsin, maybe, so that's great. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's keep it going here today. Again, uh, let's use hashtag GLASC, and we are at Analytics CONF. Uh, it's, it's a great way to interact and, and keep the conversation going uh, online, too. Okay? Uh, and lastly, we'd ask that during presentations, uh, while we encourage you to use them, your cell phones to tweet, uh, turn off the ringers so that we don't have any calls interrupting our speakers. All right. So, uh, let's get on with it. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, John Drazen. John is a lecturer in biomedical engineering at the at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And in addition to his biomedical research, John is the STEM director for Fourth Family Inc., where he engages urban students in STEM outreach using sports science and analytics. As STEM director, John has assembled a diverse team of academics, teachers, and basketball coaches and players united by a common goal of broadening educational opportunity for our youth through a shared love of sports. His work in STEM outreach has won several major awards, including the best research paper at the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, the NSF GK12 Fellowship, and the NIH IRA CDA um, <laughs> Postdoctoral Fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, John Drazen. Hello, can everybody hear me? Is my mic on? All right. It's absolutely wonderful to be uh, speaking with you guys on this uh, nice Wisconsin first day of summer. I've actually uh, only been to Wisconsin once. And uh, I was stuck in the Milwaukee airport, so this is much more pleasant. Um, so today, what I'm going to be talking about is our work using sports analytics to broaden the appeal of math and science among youth. Um, so, as we're all aware in this room, I assume that we're all sports science and sports analytics professionals. Um, in the past decade, sports science and analytics has revolutionized pro sports. So, this could be seen from the deployment of uh, high fidelity tracking cameras in the NBA, all right, to the development of cutting edge sports science labs where uh, athletes, coaches, and trainers collaborate to perfect human performance. 
All right, and as a result, and this is drawn from the MBA, the number of sports science professionals um, who are employed by the MBA and other professional sports has increased dramatically since 2008. So MBA teams, other professional teams, are pouring tons of resources into sports analytics because it is a competitive advantage. So the question I want to ask today is how can we use sports science and sports analytics to similarly revolutionize the STEM pipeline by broadening its reach, by harnessing the power of sports? So one of the reasons why I care about this, okay, is because even though I'm a white male, which is about as traditional as with STEM education as you can get, okay, when I was growing up, I liked basketball, okay? I didn't really enjoy math or science very much. So this is me, I think probably at 17, I was 6'8", 185, all right? I'm 6'8", 245 now, so I've grown a little bit. Um, but when I was in uh, math and science classes, I didn't really enjoy it. What I really liked was basketball. So it wasn't until I had my physics teacher come up to me when I was a senior in high school and introduce me to biomechanics and sports science. And that motivated me to go to SUNY Geneseo in Western New York, go state school systems, okay? And I was a four-year college athlete playing Division III basketball, okay? I dove into someone's knee and split my head open and got 28 stitches, so I like that picture, all right? But what I did is um, I had the opportunity as a senior, uh, a junior and senior, where I built my own sports biomechanics lab as my senior capstone project, okay? And that allowed me, so I built a primitive gate analysis lab, you can see that right here, okay? And that's me in the background coding. That's my friend Adam. So uh, that allowed me to be able to transition to a doctorate in biomedical engineering from RPI, all right? And now what I'm doing is, oops, sorry. Now what I'm doing is uh, I'm about to start a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania in the human motion analysis lab, all right? And so the thing is that, and not to be funny, but I owe everything I am as a scientist to my initial starting interest in sports. So if it weren't for basketball, if it wasn't for that physics teacher who took me aside and said, hey, I know how you can become a better player, and then he actually showed me how on the whiteboard using mechanical advantage and other things like that, I would not be where I am today. So what I realized is that we need to be able to provide a similar avenue for kids who like sports to get into science. Because science is pretty awesome. Engineering is pretty awesome. We just wake up every day and say, hey, what problem am I going to solve today? Because at the end of the day, science is all about just asking and answering questions and being able to trust that answer through verification. So what we can do is we can sit there and we can turn, uh, we can turn sports into a classroom, all right? So, or into a STEM endeavor. So the question, is why do we care about getting kids into STEM? So degrees in STEM are becoming increasingly valuable but inaccessible to uh, marginalized communities in the United States. So as you can see, in the past, in the present, and then into the future, okay, STEM employment is uh, projected to grow much faster than other similar disciplines. All right, changes in the economy have made it so that STEM is increasingly valuable. All right, however, there's a huge issue of representation, okay? So African Americans make up 15% of the population, however, they only make up 5% of the STEM workforce. And it goes on for Latinos, Native Americans, et cetera. So access to STEM degrees isn't just a matter of, hey, let's be more diverse with our scientists. It's a matter of economic and social equality for opening these careers. So broadening access to STEM careers has become a matter of social and economic equality. And what I'm going to be talking about today is how the people in this room as sports scientists and sport analysts can sit there and do something really, really meaningful. So the way I was kind of exposed to this is, so this is me, still more in the maybe 215 mode rather than 245. All right, this is John Scott. All right, so I played college basketball uh, with John Scott at SUNY Geneseo. And when I was, uh, when I first came back to Troy to work on my doctorate, John Scott reached out to me and said, hey man, my big men suck. I said, what? He said, listen, I need you to come do some post moves, and also my kids aren't eligible to be able to play. So can you come in and do some tutoring and some coaching? Okay, so I went to Albany High, which has a 50% graduation rate. All right, so it's a really tough area, really tough school. All right, so I started doing this coaching and tutoring and I realized that with my background in STEM and my background in basketball, 
the best way that I could coach the kids was to give them information using science and analytics. So one of my least favorite things when I was watching the kids play is all they wanted to do at a point where he would sit there, dribble up the court, dribble up the court, and then he would try to shake his man off, put his foot right on the line, and then jack a contested three. Sit there and, or a, a contested long two. I'd sit there and say, that is the worst shot in basketball, my friend. Please stop doing it. And they'd say, why? I'm like, A, you have a man in your face, okay? B, your foot's on the line. So you're pretty much taking a three, but it's worth a lot less. And they sit there and say, how do you know that? I'm like, all right, you know what? Let's go to the classroom. And I'd sit there and actually talk to them about shooting efficiency, scoring efficiency, percentages, all this other stuff. We actually would collect data on the court. And I'd sit there and say, okay, look, I'm 6'8", shoot over me. And we'd sit there and he'd take 15 shots and he would shoot 30% when I'm right here on him. And then I'd sit there and step off and he would shoot 60%. Sit there and say, look, when you're uncovered, you're a better player, all right? And that is collecting data on, on the court. And the kids sat there and they said, okay, I'm starting to understand why this is important. All right, but one of the most, uh, one of the most memorable things that uh, happened to me while I was doing this is I was running my after school tutoring program and um, we started talking about what it meant to be alive because that's one of the things that's covered on uh, the New York regents is like the seven categories that make something alive. And what we ended up doing is I ended up trying to sit there and link everything to LeBron James because pretty much I ended up just talking to the kids about basketball the majority of the time as well. So we started talking about one of the hallmarks of something being alive was the fact that it reacts to external stimulus. So we started talking about why I'm 6'8", and LeBron James is 6'8". Why can LeBron James dunk with his face on the rim, and I can dunk with like this on the rim? Okay? And what we started talking about is how your body changes in response to training. And so I had probably 10 kids in that classroom, and I was sitting there, I was talking to the two kids. We started talking about things like actin and myosin, fast twitch and slow twitch. And all of a sudden, I looked over, and the kids who had kind of been messing around the back, they'd come over. And we started talking about it. And I'm a big, I love muscle physiology. So I ended up sitting there, and I ended up acting it out to the point where, OK, so you've got something called myosin. It's climbing up like this. And I ended up giving a little, little muscle physiology seminar. All right? And then I didn't realize how effective it was until the next week, I was in the same classroom. And I heard two kids talking in the back while I was trying to speak. I went back there to yell at them, and I sat there and I saw that they were making these hand motions. And then they sit there, and I'm just listening in. And then at the end, the kid goes, yeah, and then you have one thing that climbs over the other, and that's why LeBron James can dunk like he does. Okay, and that's the reason why, <laughs> that's the reason why John Drazen can't dunk. Okay? So the thing is that the kids were able to internalize what they were doing, and they were using it to explain things to each other. And I realized that there was something meaningful there. All right, so one of the big things that we need to figure out is how can we take the passion that kids have for basketball and turn it into something that we can more or less use them to propel for their future, okay? So students' future careers are influenced by their favorite pastimes, okay? So if you have a kid who really likes watching robotics with their parents, okay, it's not that difficult to get them to sign up for a robotics club, all right? And with robotics clubs, 60% of high school participants in robotics clubs go on to have at least one career experience in STEM. Okay, so these are the kids that like robotics. All right? On the other hand, if you have a kid who's a big NBA fan, like the kids that I was working with, all right, in their free time, they play basketball. Okay, so the question is, how do they go pro in basketball? Well, they go to the NBA or the WNBA. Well, unfortunately, only 0.3% of high school basketball players go on to play any form of professional basketball. And that's not even just the NBA, that's even playing in overseas, all right? So there's not, so with kids who enjoy STEM in their free time, there's a very clear pathway into a career, whereas kids who play basketball, there's not, all right? So in a perfect world, you'd be able to go from basketball into STEM, which is what I did. Okay, but one of the big challenges is that there's all kinds of barriers to entry for the STEM pipeline for kids who don't have the proper social capital. All right, so one of the big things is that, A, you need to sign up for the program because you enjoy, or because you're already interested. So there's this, there's this pre-existing interest, prerequisite for almost all STEM activities. 
Because with my programs, I lose kids all the time to work at Burger King. And I'm literally just trying to play basketball with them and make them better. And they sit there and say, look, my mom says I need to work. So even though I'm offering a free basketball program that they really, really enjoy, even though it's free, they have to go work. So having them go to a free voluntary STEM program is completely and totally unreasonable. <clears throat> All right, so upon analysis, the traditional STEM pipeline, which is the way that we get kids into math and science careers, have complementary, or it has limited reach, so it can reach <clears throat> a group of kids who already say, like, I love science. All right, but there's an excellent career pathway. And on the other hand, the youth basketball pipeline has a huge reach. So literally millions of kids every year are playing basketball. So there's, a, there's tons and tons and tons of kids who are interested in sports and want to get better. All right? However, there's not that career trajectory like there, are, that, like there is within STEM. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to bridge these two gaps using sports science. All right? And that is the type of stuff that I discovered when I was working at Albany High for all those years in my after school programs. So the question is, if, we, if I reflect upon my own path through STEM, okay, I had, uh, I had a situational interest and I was able to transition it into an individual interest. So one of the things is that nobody sits there and loves something the first time that they do it. Okay, you say, huh, that was kind of interesting. And then once you're exposed to it repeatedly, it turns into a lifelong passion. So we can actually break this down by students start with a situational interest and they go to individual. But then you have maintained situational, okay, where pretty much you're in the situation repeatedly and that gives you space to have an, uh, an emerging interest. So with an emerging interest, what you're doing is you're redefining your perception of something. So what you're doing is you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, I thought that STEM was something that was really boring, but now that I've seen it within the context of sports, this is something I can maybe get behind. And then finally, that eventually leads to individual interest, which is how someone ends up pursuing something as a career. So this situational interest and maintained situational, this occurs within the, STEM, or within the formal STEM education system. Whereas, this in, whereas emerging interest and individual interest, okay, that occurs in the informal STEM education system. So just a definition real quick. Formal STEM education is what happens within a classroom are in informal STEM education is what happens anywhere else outside of school. So the basketball court is definitely a venue for informal STEM education. So what are the issues with the traditional STEM pipeline that we can address with sports analytics and sports science? So one of the big things is that the way that we teach our students right now in terms of STEM is that you have a bunch of primarily white luminaries who seem absolutely brilliant Okay, completely totally unattainable at the top of the mountain. Okay, and then what they did is they took their information and they distilled it into a bunch of uh, wonderful things called textbooks. Okay, and our job as students was to just sit here and just read this and think, hey, it's brilliant. And the big issue is that there's a one way, uh, uh, there's a single direction flow of knowledge. Okay, so what's happening is, what I call it is I call it paint by number science. All right, so for example, if you're doing an experiment on biology in biology class, okay, if you're doing plants, if you sit there and put a seed into the ground, you know it's gonna grow, right? You know that you, it's predestined. You're not discovering anything new. And also, the teacher always knows what's gonna happen with the experiment because they have the curriculum. So the beautiful thing about sports analytics and sports science is that it can turn teachers and students into co-investigators. Uh, one of my favorite experiences that I had in the after school program was we started getting an argument, uh, I argue with my students a lot, but we got in an argument about um, whether or not being left handed was an advantage in the NBA. And so we threw, about, we threw out a bunch of different ideas, okay? And what ended up happening is that we ended up settling on the following test, if you want to say that. So obviously being tall is good for the NBA, right? You've got to be got to be some, some height. So what the students came up with is that they hypothesized that if being left-handed was an advantage, if you looked at the average height of left-handed NBA players compared to right-handed NBA players, if the average height of left-handed NBA players is lower than right-handed NBA players, that means that they gain some net benefit from being left-handed. 
So we can talk about that over lunch, whether or not that tracks. But this is something that the students came up with themselves. And they actually spent about three hours in an after school situation. Once again, these are kids who are failing biology. They're failing remedial biology. And then, but they spent literally three hours in an after school setting collecting a bunch of data, going online, doing all this research, learning how to do averages, standard deviations, et cetera. All right, and the thing is that they'd sit there and say, well, what's the answer? I'd say, I don't know. What do you guys think it is? We gotta do this research together. So they kind of realize what scientific discovery was. All right, so what we can do is we can use basketball training as a venue for STEM engagement. So the issue is that a lot of the traditional ways that sports are used within educational curriculum is that you see something that's very contrived like this. So it's just teaching basic kinematics, let's say, through the basketball shop. The fundamental issue is that this is not actionable. So if I solve this problem, I'm not really gonna know very much about how I should position my hand on the ball, right? And it's also very, very similar to like a problem like shooting a cannon off of a cliff. You know, there's not anything really intrinsically basketball. It's the basketball here is window dressing, all right? And the thing is that what we need to do and what I've been able to do in my programs is we're able to transition it into more professional sports science. So for example, heat maps are absolutely phenomenal. Okay, because it is a piece of information, it's a, it's a graphic that communicates so much actionable information. Right, so the thing is that people sit here and they see this and they say, whoa, what is that? And then you explain it to them and it's something that they can incorporate into their practice and into their game. All right, so what you need to do, and this is one of my first pieces of advice for everybody, is that when you're working with students, make every, all the type of information that you give them actionable. All right, so what we need to do is rather than sugarcoating traditional STEM content with basketball, a basketball covering, what you need to do is you need to sit there and make it so that the kids are investigating something with you. And this goes for high school level and uh, college level. All right, so one of the first things that we developed, all right, um, I know that uh, Zach is really into jumping with vert, um, but one of the things that kids also love the vertical jump, okay? So one of the big things that we try to do is make it so that the kids are able to understand the technology that we're using. So me and a team from RPI built a vertical uh, jump measurement system that we call the jump plate, okay, that uses the flight time method. So, and I know that we're all biomechanics and sports analytics guys here, but I'll just explain it real quick. So pretty much it's a box with a force sensor resistor in it, where when you jump, you, un, you pretty much uncompress, you depress uh, the force sensitive resistor, and pretty much that creates a drop in signal. And then when you land, it comes back down. And as a result, you can get a measurement for hang time. And what you can do is you can apply basic physics and sit there and come up with a function that relates vertical jump height to the hang time. And the very cool thing is that these systems can be made for under 70 bucks. And you can make them about two hours. So here's a basic overview of what, what's on the inside. It uses just a low cost Arduino system, a, a four sensor resistor. Here's an example of the circuit, so it's very straightforward. And the thing is that I've built this, I've probably built 50 of these at this point. So I built them across the country. I went out to All-Star Weekend and ran a program at the Crenshaw YMCA. I've been out in San Francisco on the Google campus, all this other stuff. Um, and we're able to make these very quickly and the kids immediately understand. They sit there and say, oh, so you're saying it's like a button? Yes. And then they understand how the technology works. It's not like a black box where you're just saying, look, I'm a scientist, trust me the kids can actually understand how it works. And one of the cool things is that the fabrication is a teaching moment. So the kids will sit there and say, and also the teachers and also the college students I've built these with, they sit there and say, I feel like I'm actually doing science. And in reality, they're doing carpentry, right? And assembling a little baby circuit. But they feel like they're being empowered as scientists because they're not just opening, ripping open in a box and following instructions. So I've used these systems in the classroom a lot. So I use them in the physics classes, okay? So we'll sit there and we'll compare um, a reference measurement versus the measurement that we're getting there. And we can actually, I actually taught these guys linear, regre uh, linear regression. <clears throat> I've used it in biology classes a lot. And once again, you can see that the kids immediately hop on the laptops. <clears throat> they start using everything, all right? 
And what I do is I use it to teach the scientific method. And then finally, one of my favorite things I use it in gym class. So what I'll do is I'll bring it in the gym class and we'll sit there and talk about performance science. And I don't know if people can read this, but uh, middle school girls and boys are very competitive with each other. And uh, I did this down in Maryland uh, a few months ago. And you, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it says girls won everywhere. So we had a jumping contest between girls, boys, and teachers. All right, and the girls got the highest average score, and they were very excited about it. So one of the things is that sports science is beautiful because it's cross-disciplinary. You can incorporate it into almost any subject. I actually had a lot of fun using the jump plates in an earth science classroom because I sat there and I took the kids through a tour of the solar system by having them calculate how high they would have jumped based on the jump plate measurement on different planets. And we actually did an evaluation of this and the kids actually were able to sort uh, the planets based on their relative mass, um, based on, uh, just because they remember the jump heights. They're like, oh, I want to go to Pluto, because I'm going to be like 360 dunk, and all this other stuff. Okay, so it's all about just making it related to their interests. So one of the big things is that, so as I've just discussed, we can sit there and we can incorporate these materials into the traditional classroom. However, what we want to do is that really, in order for these kids to really internalize what this means and really uh, take ownership of it. We want to be able to transition them from formal STEM education into informal. So what we want to do is we want to provide an accessible informal learning environment in which the students can use STEM to enhance their understanding of their own interests outside of STEM. All right, so what, why is STEM, informal STEM education so important? So informal STEM education like, is defined by research experience active learning and forming communities. Okay, I have, a very, I have a good friend who sits there and he taught, he's like a very, very nice older white guy and he just sits there and says, I love your programs. It gives kids, gives kids a flock to fly with. Okay, and the thing is it's about forming communities. That's the beautiful thing about working with teams. And how many trainers do we have in here? Like raise your hand if you work directly with teams. Okay, who's an academic? Raise your hand. Who's a student? Uh, who works with pro teams? All right. So, well, okay. So the thing is that that's the beautiful thing about the team environment, okay, is that you form a community and you're working together towards a common goal. So in informal STEM education, what happens is the kids are able to learn STEM and identify as a scientist. And what's really cool is that when the kids learn STEM, it increases their confidence and it motivates them to identify as a scientist. And then on the other hand, once they identify as a scientist, it increases their confidence and it gives them motivation to learn STEM. So the big thing is that if we can get these kids who were not interested in STEM at all to start with, if we can transition them into these sports science and sports analytics based programs, we can have this recursive cycle take place where they can sit there and take ownership of STEM. Because once again, STEM is, it's, it's, it's just asking questions and finding answers and being able to say, I can trust this. And we're all interested in things, we're all curious, we're all interested, okay? We all have questions, and science is just a way to do that. And we can do that with sports using the techniques that we're gonna be talking about in this conference. So the question is, how can we create an authentic, yet accessible introduction to STEM using sports science and sports ethics? So the first thing is we wanna situate the program with an existing youth basketball programs as a training tool. Okay, so the fundamental problem with the STEM pipeline right now is that we can't get the kids into the programs because they don't have a pre-existing interest. Okay, but as anyone with kids can attest, I don't have kids yet, I'm getting married in two weeks. Okay, so they might be coming at some point. But youth sports is pervasive. There's youth leagues everywhere. Okay, so the beautiful thing about sports science, sports analytics, is that you can directly interface with youth sports. Right? And you can use the youth sports network to deliver this STEM content. So the first thing is you want to situate the program within existing programs as a training tool so that you can reach previously disengaged populations. And the second thing is you want to provide youth players with accessible analytical tools to explore and inform their own performance. So by the way, so th these are uh, pictures that were taken from the Marcus Aldridge, uh, Marcus Aldridge Skills Academy, where pretty much we uh, had Marcus Aldridge come up to Albany, New York, which was pretty exciting, and we did a big STEM combine with him. 
It was pretty awesome. But these are actually kids who we've worked with for a number of years. So all the pictures of kids using technology and all that stuff, that's actually pictures from our pro. So basketball training. Um, oh, so one of my favorite things is, so I talked about the, uh, the jump plate, right, within the classroom setting. But what I do is I actually bring the jump plates into basketball settings as well, where I'll literally just show up at a basketball court, or in this case, I showed up at the Albany High basketball uh, team practice. All right, and what we did is I actually collected data from the JV and varsity teams, right, and the kids were actually running the equipment. And what we did is we wanted to see what the effect of position and team was on vertical jump height. So we sat there, we collected the data, and I whipped up this graph real quick, where blue is the varsity team, orange is the junior varsity, there, uh, the error bars are standard deviation, and then this is center, this is forward, this is guard. All right, so the information that jumps out very quickly is that the JV centers are not very good at jumping. They can't jump very high. So this guy, this sort of heavy set guy right here is one of the JV centers, so we're kind of driving the scores down. Um, but one of the things is, so I, get, I handed out all these, uh, all these results to uh, the student athletes. And they immediately sat there and said, oh, the JV centers suck, blah, blah. And they started ragging on them. And one of the JV centers had jumped pretty high, like over 20 inches, the system says, why are my results all the way down here? And what are, the, what are these little bars right here? So they say, oh, those are error bars. It says, what do they mean? So there and I explained what standard deviation was, and I explained all the different content that underpins these calculations. Sister and says, oh, so you're saying that standard deviation is a representation of how distributed the data is, and that means I don't suck. So, I mean, you can interpret it that way. So we spent the rest of the practice being like, y'all are bums. <laughs> this is your fault. See that error bar? That's me. That's all me. OK? And from what I've experienced, if you get the kids arguing with each other using data, you got them. All right? So what we did is we expanded this, uh, this uh, platform out to include, pretty much we made a DIY version of the NBA Rookie Combine that we use with, uh, when we run basketball camps now in other clinics. Okay, so pretty much uh, it's an NBA working combine that you can build for $250. Um, and the cool thing is that it's easy to build and accessible so that I literally build it with the Albany High basketball team or whatever basketball team I'm working with at that point. And the kids are really motivated, like, oh, I wanna be able to understand my own performance. So I sit there and say, we need to spend seven to 10 hours building a circuit or whatever, building the entire thing. They're motivated to do it because also at the end of the day, they get to meet a pro player, which is pretty cool. But so we have strength, where pretty much we created a push-up counter, right, where it can automatically count how many push-ups you do. Um, we have the vertical jump tester, but we also have a quickness test, where we have the pro agility drill with lasers, which always gets the kids excited. And we also have the lane agility drill. And so as I said, we did this with, uh, uh, with Marcus Aldridge um, two years ago. Last year we did it with Emmanuel Moutier. This year we're doing it with Emmanuel Moutier and Jeff Green, which would be really cool. Um, and the really cool thing about getting the kids involved with developing these products is that they get really excited about it and they tell me things I didn't even know. So um, I was trying to figure out how we we're gonna communicate the data to the kids, to the other campers. And I sat there and said, hey guys, I was talking to the students who were helping me build everything. I said, hey guys, look, I came up with this. So this bottom part with the histograms. I said, what is that? Oh, they're histograms. And I explained the entire thing. I said, oh, you should just do it like they do in FIFA. So they say, what? And it turns out that in FIFA, they use polar plots or spider plots, whatever you want to call it, or uh, radar graphs to sit there and represent data. And the kids, the, the, the high school students who I was working with, they were dialed in to subculture or whatever you want to say. And they knew about these video game things. So they sit there and they tell me, they show me, how, they show me what they wanted, I made it, and it's been extraordinarily popular because the kids just said, oh, it's just like 2K, it's just like uh, FIFA. All right, so data visualization is phenomenally important, and having it and tapping into your athlete's ability to communicate with each other is very, very important. So here's explaining the results to some kids at the academy. So once again, I'm a scientist. Okay, so I wanted to sit there and see what effects my programs were having on these kids. So I gave them a questionnaire before and after the program. Um, so I asked them, uh, 
using the Likert scale. Uh, how familiar are you with sports science? You can see that we had a dramatic increase. Then I asked them, I think I can use science to improve my basketball training. All right, originally, most of them were just kind of confused about it, but you can see dramatic increase. So these kids are starting to view science as a competitive advantage for athletics. And then finally, this is my favorite one, I enjoy doing math or science when I'm not in school. And once again, this is a bunch of basketball players. They were like, eh, and you can see that it dramatically shifted to the right, which indicates a much more positive response. So once again, this isn't just something that's a cool story. We've actually been able to collect a lot of data. So I've just been talking about the sports science component, and you guys might be wondering, this is an analytics conference. So I'm gonna get to the analytics right now. All right, so we can also use sports analytics to create a similar connection between the kids, science, and sports. So what we want to be able to do is, so actually, does anyone know about the NOAA system? The NOAA shot system? That is really cool. When I first started doing this work, NOAA wasn't at the point where they were at. Um, because, so now they have a lot of really cool tech. So NOAA is a system where pretty much you put a webcam over the, over the hoop at like distance of like 12 feet. And they can actually do a lot of really cool things like generating heat maps with a pretty low cost. But two years ago, they weren't where they are now. So uh, pretty much when we first came up with this program, what we wanted to be able to do is we wanted to be able to have it so that the kids could make their own heat maps without having to pay to have a uh, sports view camera system put into their, uh, their high school gyms. Okay, so what we can do is we can use old school stats that you can collect with a pen and paper, all right, and then use it with modern visualization. So what we did is we developed a shooting clinic where we had the kids collect shooting percentages and scoring efficiency. And you can calculate that very easily, right? So, so for shooting percentages, it's just number of makes over total times 100, right? And the number of makes times point value over total, right? And what you can do is you can actually create heat maps like you see here that the kids can literally calculate all of the values that go into it. And then you can create a program that can plot it in a very nice manner. So what we did is we collected this data during shooting clinics. And we had, uh, so there's the traditional basketball uh, drill called two, man, uh, two ball, three man shooting. And you have a shooter, rebounder, and passer. So what we did is we just added in a data recorder and gave them a data sheet that looks, right, that looks like this right here, where they recorded their own data and then they rotated so each player had an opportunity to take 10 shots at each one of these 14 locations. And then we made a Python heat map program that generated heat maps based on their results. So we ran uh, a series of clinics, all right, and we wanted to do a number of tests. So the first thing is that we wanted to see if the kids that we were working with with this study were attracted to the program based on basketball training, not STEM, because we wanted to sit there and see if we were able to break that pre-existing interest stranglehold on STEM education. All right, another thing is that we wanted to sit there and study whether or not analytics would be seen as an authentic way to improve at basketball. And then finally, the third outcome is accessible sport analytics will allow athletes to increase their interest in STEM. So we wanted to sit there and see, okay, one, are we reaching the population we want to work with? Two, are they going to see analytics as an authentic training tool to improve? And then three, will that increased interest in analytics through sports lead to an increased interest in the STEM fields in general? So what we did is we uh, gave them Likert score, uh, we gave them the surveys beforehand, uh, and then we collected data, we gave them their heat maps and had some personalized discussions with them about what they should be training based on what they saw and where they should be passing their teammates, et cetera. And then we collected data after that discussion. So we used a, a Likert test, um, and you already saw one of these, but first we looked at the, distri the distribution beforehand and the distribution afterwards. And then we plotted them over each other to see what relative shifts we, uh, we saw. So the way that we evaluated it is we tested shifts question by question using one-sided Wilcoxon sign rank test because we cannot assume what interval data. And then we looked at outcome two and outcome three, which was the bridges between the three different categories. And we evaluated it by averaging the groups of questions. And then we tested the validity of the grouping using a Kronbach alpha. Um, so the first outcome that we looked at all right, was are we preaching to the choir still? So 62% of our students uh, per, uh, attended a urban high school uh, that served over 50% economically disadvantaged students. So we were working with needy populations. 
35% of the popul uh, of our participants were female, which was actually very, very good. And that's the exciting thing about sports. I talk to people all the time. They sit there and say, why don't you do something for girls? Why don't you do something for, uh, why don't you do dance? Dance will get the girls. I'm like, you obviously don't know how hard female basketball players work. Okay, so the thing is that we're able to get a lot of females into our programs by focusing on sports. And then finally, 53% of the participants identified as either African American or Latino who are very underrepresented in STEM right now. And there's one of my favorite questions. So what I did is I also ran similar programs as a comparison with traditional STEM outreach programs. So I asked uh, the traditional STEM outreach program kids, how interested are you in studying STEM in college? So in the red is the traditional STEM outreach guys. And you can see that they're, they're all like, okay, yes, I'm very, very interested. All right? Whereas with basketball, the, kid, the uh, sports attracted kids, which is in green, they, they were open to it, but the median response was not effectively hell yes. Okay, so you can see that there's a different interest profile between the tr traditional STEM education groups and the non-traditional, all right? And then I asked the two different groups, how interested are you in playing basketball? How interested are you in playing basketball in college? Okay, so you can see that the STEM, the STEM group wasn't really interested in basketball at all. Okay, and the basketball group was very, very interested in basketball. Okay, so this highlights the potential power of using sports to engage kids in STEM because it's entirely two different subsets of kids. All right, um, so how did uh, participation change perception of training? So do you know where on the court you need to practice shooting from? Do you know uh, what you need to practice in order to improve your shooting skills? How confident are you in your ability to evaluate your own strengths and weaknesses as a shooter? And then do you think you know about, enough about basketball to, improve, uh, to reach your goals as a player? Okay, and we had statistically significant increases in all of these questions. Uh, how did participation change perception of analytics? How familiar are you with sports analytics? Dramatic shift to the right. Do you think you can use sports analytics to improve your own game? Dramatic shift. Are you, are you interested in learning how you can use math and science to be a better basketball player? Increase, statistically significant increase. Okay, so we're changing these kids' perception of the role of science in their athletic performance. So then finally, the big one, how did participation change perception of STEM? So do you think you can take the topics that you learn in math and science classes to make you a better basketball player? Okay, look at that change. Okay, I'm asking them, hey, do you think that what you learn in school can make you a better basketball player? Look at that shift. Okay, it's changing their perception. We can all do this. Do you enjoy using math and science out of school? I think this is probably my favorite graph because you sit there and see it's like just like flat. And then you have a dramatic shift over to the right because everyone was inspired. And then finally, how interested are you in studying math, science, or engineering in college? All right, statistically significant increase. And once again, if you, based on what you saw with the demographic data, this is a very different population than who is traditionally reached from these. So uh, what we're able to see is that we had good intergroup consistency. So we had a lot of responses on the long answer form. Go from I need to work on my I need to work on my footwork and form, to I need to work on mid-range and three-pointers. Okay, so the incorporation of analytics gave them something instead of just saying generally, like, I need to change my footwork, to saying I need to practice from these specific locations on the floor. And then our average group, uh, analytics, STEM, uh, group metric was good, all right? And uh, we asked them uh, in long form, do you think that math, what you learn in math and science class can help you in basketball? And uh, this is one of my favorite responses. No, because we're learning about proofs, and proofs don't help you with basketball. And I can't really argue with that. All right, but then the same student, after participating in the program, says, yes, because you need to know percentages where, to know where you can shoot from. Okay, and my favorite thing about this response isn't the fact that it changed, but is the fact that this student took something that's as simple as percentages and identified it as math and science. That's one of the biggest things that I find frustrating about the way the public and kids perceive math and science, is math and science, you can use whatever tool is sufficient. You don't have to sit there and spend a million dollars on a lab to answer questions if you can do it yourself with a pen and paper. You don't need to sit there and use expensive equipment. 
Math and science is the process of just asking and answering questions. And we can see that with this response, because once you get percentages, you learn that in fourth grade. And yet we have like a high schooler who's sitting there and saying, this is science. So that's important. So once again, I just want to, I'm wrapping up now, but science not communicated is science not done. That's one of my favorite quotes. All right, because once again, if we're not able to convince athletes of the importance of the things that we're measuring and how it applies to their sport, we shouldn't even be doing it. Okay, so what I would argue is that these programs that I'm talking about not only serve a public good in the fact that we're providing economic opportunity to these kids through STEM outreach, but I would argue that by demystifying math and science by using these simple tools and demystifying analytics, you can have it so that you have more motivated athletes who really want to dig into this understanding. All right, well, another one of my favorite quotes is the one of, with Shane Battier where he says, I do analytics and science is just another tool like going into the gym to improve as a basketball player. Okay, and by sitting here and by developing these tools, we can make it so that all athletes can understand what we're doing in the lab, what we're doing when we're make, writing code to do analytics and everything, and have it so that they can really participate and contribute to the discussion about their data. So what have we learned generally? So first off, youth basketball players can improve their basketball training using analytics. Okay, just using a simple thing like this gives them more insight into their own performance. And then second, analytics demonstrates how STEM concepts can explain and improve athletic performance. All right, so once again, we're taking something that is completely totally unrelated to their life and then applying it to something that they love and they're passionate about. All right, so what we've been able to do is we've been able, with our programs, we've been able to transition kids all the way from situational interest to maintain situational to emerging interest and then individual interest. So I have 10 kids in college right now, which is not my children, okay? Uh, but I, I have 10 kids who have come up through my programs who are now in college, all right? And they're studying math, science, public health, physical therapy, and stuff like that. And what they do is they come back to the program and they serve as mentors for the younger generation. So we've all built this entire pipeline all through our shared passion for sports. So the social impact of sports and athletics extends way past uh, wins and championships. Okay, you can see that from all of the different social uh, movements that focus around, uh, around science, or sorry, around ath athletics. Okay, so athletes have been given this huge platform to do social good and to sit there and talk about equity. And the thing is that what I really want you guys to take away from my talk today is that analytics and at the analytics community can do something similar around STEM education. All right, thank you. All right, thanks, John. Um, I don't know. We have time for maybe two questions before we take a quick break and head down to 374 if anyone's got any questions for John. Oh yeah, I mean that's honestly one of the biggest things is that sitting there and making it so that we have a pipeline of analytically informed players. That's one of the, one of the big like knock-on effects of this is that if we can sit there and have it so that they're exposed to this young, it's not going to be a foreign language when they get to the NBA. So I think that there's definitely some downstream effects potentially. Anybody else? Uh, so there are some real, so I'm not, so since we won MIT Sloan, I've been talking with a bunch of different people. There are, there are some similar programs um, in terms of uh, this really cool program called Team Incorporated out, out of Oakland, where they teach kids how to do video scouting using sports code and huddle. Um, but I think that our program is pretty unique because once again, I'm, I'm a white dude from the suburbs and I was connected through basketball to somebody who made it out of one of the worst neighborhoods in Albany through basketball. So it's kind of a very unique meeting, I would say, because we can get into, I can bring people from RPI directly into Clinton Ave, which is one of the worst neighborhoods in Albany. So it's a very unique collaboration. So 
So the high school teachers get very excited about it. Um, I, I've worked, so I had a, the NSF GK12 fellowship where I got to teach in a classroom, in a high school classroom for two years. Um, so the big thing is that the, the teachers really just want to have something that gets the kids excited about something. So uh, for example, bringing the jump plate, the number one thing that I do is I sit there and just teach them the experimental method. And they sit there and they just collect data. And typically what they'll do is they'll be like, oh, who can jump higher, girls or boys? Um, one of the things that they, this happened like 10 times, they sit there and say, can white men jump? So uh, they'll sit there and do uh, vertical jump contests uh, between uh, different groups of people. And they sit there and they actually are motivated to make the hypothesis. And they actually collect the data and it's good. So the big thing is uh, making it so that, like you really need to be passionate about basketball for this. Um, because if you sit there and if you go up to uh, inner city kids and you say, hey, like, you probably like basketball, they're gonna be like, forget you. You know, whereas if you sit there and if you say, I love basketball, I wanna share what I've learned about it with you, it's a very different conversation. So there's one more. So uh, I've done stuff with soccer and football. Um, so I actually, I just ran, so since there's a lot of academics here, um, I just ran a big program with the uh, RPI men's and women's soccer and basketball team. So pretty much I ran an eight week program uh, with them where they actually developed their own sports performance testing because um, they were doing research on it, et cetera. Um, and I kind of guided them through that process. And then we ran a big sports science clinic for uh, local high school athletic departments. So pretty much we had 160 kids from local high school athletic departments come from like, uh, and they pretty much did like a two hour sports science clinic. And um, it was really good. I actually had a bunch of uh, female soccer players um, asking to do research with me. Um, and then also I had a few of them switch from business to biomedical engineering, which was different and wonderful. But so you can really, I mean, once again, it's all about just creating an area of shared interest with the kids. I mean, you can, I, I know somebody who I helped develop a knitting program where she just goes in after school and knits with people. And she just taught, she teaches algorithms through knitting. And if I tried to do that, I would shoot myself. <laughs> uh, but she really likes it, and she found like a group of three or four African American female high school students who also like it, and she's now just mentoring them through knitting. So the big thing is that you can really apply math and science to anything. Everyone has questions. So just think about what you like to do. All right, so uh, knitting analytics next year, yeah, yes. same time. All right, yes. how about another round of applause for John? All right, thank you very much. All right, so uh, we've got about five minutes until our breakout sessions start. And again, that's right down the hall in room 374, which is to the left. Uh, Andre Alvarez will be talking about